Hi again. This uh, video is the first of a two-part session that takes a look at alternative investments. Uh, alternative investments are exactly as you'd expect, the alternative to the most commonly used investments, stocks, bonds, and money market funds. In today's session, we're going to take a look principally at private equity, but we'll start off with an introduction and we'll discuss some of the other categories of alternative investments. Uh, alternative investments are a broad set of possible alternatives. And really, there is no limit to the, the number of types of investments we have in that set. We'll start off by listing and explaining what the major types of alternative investments are in this session. We'll characterize some of the common features of those alternative investments, taking a look at the markets in which they are traded, and discuss how they can be used in, a, in, over, in your overall portfolio. We'll also list and explain the, the due diligence checkpoints that we'd use in selecting managers for alternative investments and explain and interpret some of the special issues that are going to affect alternative investments for each class of those investments. Some of the types that are more, most commonly quoted start off with the traditional versions of alternative investments. A fund manager might be looking for diversification from stocks and bonds and find some of that through both direct and indirect investments in real estate. And we'll look at that in just a minute. We'll also take a look in this session at private equity. And private equity includes all of the different types of private equity, such as venture capital, leverage buyout financing, financing for late stage investments. We'll also have a look at commodities in the next video. Some of the things that we describe as modern alternative uh, alternative investments include things like hedge funds, managed futures, distressed equities, Bitcoin, and we'd say that's, that these type of investments uh, are alternative, but they're more like trading strategies, especially for example in the case of things like, like managed futures or hedge funds. Some of the common features for all types of alternative investments, they tend to be relatively difficult to trade because they aren't easily standardized and uh, they don't trade on a standard exchange. So because they're illiquid, there's going to be a premium for that illiquidity. Uh, it also provides us with an opportunity for diversification that we can't find with other forms of investment. And there may be higher costs of managing the fund because of the cost of ensuring the quality of the portfolio. The due diligence costs are going to be higher. Um, there also may be difficulty appraising the performance of things like private equity funds or hedge funds because of the difficulty in establishing and applying uh, appropriate benchmarks. Now, the reason why we hold alternative investments in a portfolio, <clears throat> they provide us with exposure to certain risk factors that we can't get through stocks and bonds. For example, real estate gives us a very long-term exposure to obviously real estate markets which are going to be great hedge against inflation and perhaps are going to appreciate because of other industry specific factors commercial real estate or residential real estate perhaps because of the limited supply of land um, we also would say that uh, they give us exposure to particular strategies for example a hedge fund strategy might be exactly what we're looking for for our portfolio and so we can invest indirectly in that strategy by putting our money through into the hedge fund which will then invest in that particular uh, investing approach we have would save it for for most of these things the exposure to risk factors and the specialized investment strategies might be combined through private equity and things like distressed securities securities that are on the the verge of of failure and may be sold at these deep discounts both bonds and stocks. Due diligence is essentially the process of proving the quality of an asset. And so some of the things that we have to look at in order to determine whether there is a, a real basis for investment include the quality of the, the market opportunity. Is this something that's going to be a good long-term investment or will this investment's uh, benefits, its attractiveness be fleeting? What's the process for investment? Um, which uh, which fund manager is best, which approach is going to be best. Are, are the, uh, the organizations that we're investing in reliable? Are they stable? <clears throat> uh, does the organization have uh, all of the, uh, uh, the, the basic 
criteria that we would require in a partner. Are they reliable? Or are they stable? The people involved in this transaction, are they trustworthy? The terms of the deal, are they fair? Is there fair compensation for the relative degree of risk that each party is taking? Uh, have we got the uh, infrastructure in terms of lawyers and accountants to, to uh, support this? Have we got the documentation? A problem that we found was seriously uh, uh, deficient during the 2008-2009 financial crisis when mortgage-backed securities turned out to be very poorly documented and, and as a result the quality of security that was promised really wasn't there. And then finally, as part of our due diligence process, we have to be able to write this up. So these are the type of things that we check. And this list isn't exhaustive. There are a number of other things that we could look at depending on the unique nature of a particular investment. Some of the uh, <clears throat> concerns that may affect the in that are our particular clients, especially if we're dealing with well, substantially wealthy prime uh, private individuals. Uh, things like tax issues. Also, um, is the is the particular type of investment suitable for the uh, client's portfolio? Does it provide the right amount of liquidity? Can uh, can liquidity can cash be released at certain point in the future when the client may need that uh, that funding? Will we be able to communicate adequately with our client? And we have a very complicated, um, a very complicated investment strategy. Will we be able to make them aware? Because unless our clients really understand what we're doing, we're not doing our job. Um, and also, there may be a, a problem with changing your mind partway through the process because of illiquidity of the particular investments. Sometimes investments get lo get locked in for a very long period of time. And uh, we may end up with our client being stuck in a very concentrated equity position in one single company because of the large buy-in required for certain types of investments. There are, as I said, an unlimited list of possible alternative investments. One of the most recent and probably one of the most interesting uh, in recent days has been Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is uh, something that is essentially a, a currency, a, an electronic currency or a cryptocurrency that provides investors with the, the benefits of putting their money into a, a well-managed currency without the government intervention. Essentially this happens outside of the, the control of governments and we don't have to worry about a government deciding to print money because, well, at least according to the proponents of cryptocurrencies, the blockchain process that's used to create the currency is incorruptible, uh, unlike governments, which can decide to, to increase substantially the supply of money based on particular policy decisions. Well, if it is a good investment, there's an interesting question of should our investment managers be buying into this for us? There's an interesting example here of a very large, uh, a very large investment bank or fund manager called Fortress Investment Group deciding that they were going to going to create a very large uh, Bitcoin position and uh, they, they found that they they made a substantial loss on this now if they were investing your money if you gave them a million dollars of your money and uh, they put that into Bitcoin and they lost your money you'd probably be asking a couple of questions was Bitcoin an appropriate investment partly because of the novelty and the fact that it's so difficult to understand. But secondly, why do we have to have a fund manager to put our money into a currency? Why can't we just do it ourselves? In this case, it wasn't a substantial amount of money. $8 million loss for Fortress is not a huge loss. And secondly, the fund was Fortress's own money, so they were not really, not really betting with their client's money. But it was interesting to see this. It's certainly not the kind of a headline that uh, the fund managers wanted to see. No. There are a lot of different ways to invest in real estate. We can invest directly or indirectly. Now, directly is quite simply buying property, buying residences, commercial real estate, uh, buying raw land, agricultural land as well. So it's possible that our, our investment fund could make be a direct investor in land. Uh, indirect investment is easier. The investments tend to be more liquid. We can cash out of part or all of our investment at any point in time with relatively uh, little risk of illiquidity. Essentially, <clears throat> indirect investment is done through 
companies like real estate investment trusts, REITs or REITs. Um, those are publicly traded. They trade just like stocks. They're traded on stock exchange. They're listed. Uh, sometimes they're also described as unit trusts in certain markets with a focus on real estate. And they can be targeted at particular segments of the real estate market. There can be a residential or a commercial raw land and an agricultural uh, real estate investment trust that focuses specifically on those markets. It can be focused in certain geographic areas. It can also be international in nature. We also have uh, uh, funds that are managed professionally that are operate exactly like REITs that are called commingled real estate funds. Essentially, they're run by a fund manager with, with, with capital provided by several different investors. That's what we mean by commingled. Uh, we can have separately managed real estate accounts that are managed by a professional real estate manager for our fund. And we also have separate funds that only invest in infrastructure projects. Roads, bridges, hospitals mm -hmm. are another interesting one. In fact, we even have things like uh, uh, infrastructure funds that will invest in student residences. So it's not impossible that a student residence could be funded, not by the university, which does not get government funding, to build uh, student residences, but could be could be run on the university's land through a contract with the university to build residences, own and operate them for a period of time, and then at the end of that period, the ownership reverts back to the to the university along with the land, of course. Here's an example of uh, of a type of a commingled fund. It's called the Sun Life Participating Account Real Estate uh, Holdings. And it tells you the kind of investments that they put their money into. Sun Life, of course, is I think Canada, still Canada's largest uh, 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 pension provider. And uh, in this particular fund, it's uh, over a billion dollar fund. It's got a billion dollars worth of real estate assets. And so you could buy into, or your fund could buy into an asset like this. And you can see the breakdown in property types, a lot of retail investment, some office investment, a lot of office investment, some industrial, a little bit of residential and raw land. If you want to know how well your fund is doing, you want to have a benchmark like all other types of investment. And the kind of benchmarks that we see, and I think I've mentioned this in an earlier session, include things like benchmarks that are provided by two national associations in the United States called NCREF, which looks at uh, <clears throat> direct investments. Uh, and we have NARIAT, which looks at real estate investment trusts or indirect investments. And so th these are different types of indexes that are calculated slightly differently. It's much harder to provide an index for direct investments because we have to wait for the asset to sell in order for it to be valued. So we can only look at the recent sales of properties. And the selling price of properties is so different from one area to another, from one market to another, for example, uh, for real estate, uh, residential real estate versus commercial, the markets may be very illiquid and we have often very stale data. On the other hand, the Nariat index is much easier to operate because it operates in real time as the stock markets trade real estate investment trust uh, funds. Some general characteristics of real estate that tend to be uh, true across all types of real estate investments, direct and indirect. Uh, the asset will always have some intrinsic value. Um, a portfolio of residential real estate uh, is essentially a portfolio of people's homes. And so there will always be some intrinsic or some real value that's associated with that. Um, if there's a, a regular flow of rental income, for example, retail is typically a reliable source of uh, rental income. It provides us with stable and predictable returns and cash flows that can be easily predicted. Uh, direct investment in particular is uh, highly illiquid because quite often we can't sell a property for a long period of time. Uh, adding property to a portfolio is done in very large increments, perhaps million dollars or $10 million at a time. Uh, when we buy and sell, in, sell a property, there are both uh, high transaction costs due to the, the, the transaction itself, but also because of taxation. Property may be very different from one part of the country, from one particular class to another. So we say that uh, one unit of property is being very different means that it's heterogeneous 
not homogeneous. Uh, immobility, you can't easily move from a, a low value market to another. If you could take your apartment building that you own in Winnipeg and move it to Toronto or Vancouver, it might be worth three times as much, but unfortunately that's not practical. Uh, we have poor quality of information, especially for direct uh, investment in real estate. Uh, the, the market is driven by things like uh, population growth, immigration, and also by uh, interest rates because uh, there's a very high interest rate risk exposure with property. And we also say that uh, inflation tends to be good news for real estate, but the message is not always uh, a, a clear-cut one. So there are mixed results when we talk about the effect of inflation. In our portfolio, having real estate <clears throat> is, is generally a good thing because we have a low correlation with both stocks and bonds. Uh, we have the, the, the regular yield that we receive through rental properties because real estate investment trusts tend to be have a low standard deviation and an average return. They increase our sharp ratio on average. Uh, they improve the diversification uh, relative to stocks and bonds. But if we've got other types of investments that provide us with the same kind of exposures like hedge funds or commodities, they may, not, may be redundant. And uh, there's typically a low correlation within the real estate category between uh, different types of investments, commercial versus residential, for, for example, and between different parts of the country or different parts places in the world. So this is typically an important part of most portfolios. There are <clears throat> always going to be some, some general issues of uh, due diligence valuation is easy to do on the day that you buy and sell a property but in between the transactions we have a very limited ability to measure the valuation measure the property value there may be uh, restrictions in financing there could also be uh, problems with uh, land ownership for example we have uh, land that is always contested uh, involving First Nations, for example. And there may be taxation issues with transactions when we're not talking about a private residence. There may be issues of capital gains tax on, on the transfer of property. So some of the ad advantages and disadvantages for direct uh, real estate investment, some of the advantages, we have possibility of tax subsidies. Governments may have particular interest in in building up one part of the country geographically in certain countries and there may also be uh, t a, a tax benefits with uh, residential mortgages we can usually we can typically use a lot of leverage in the portfolio because real estate is something that is very easy to lend against because of collateral quality uh, <clears throat> we uh, have a premium for control because uh, you know, if we do need to uh, uh, do need to make changes to the property, ownership provides us with a lot of right. By being geographically diversified in all parts of a country, a large country like Canada, we have an advantage of diversification inside of our portfolio, and they have relatively low volatility of our assets uh, value relative to those of equities. Of course, the disadvantages. Sometimes our sales, our properties are owned in large blocks like apartment buildings that are hard to sell. Um, <clears throat> so a single property can be a large part of our portfolio. And that's obviously a problem that individuals have where perhaps 80 or 90 percent of their wealth is tied up in one single property. Um, properties may be unique, so there may be difficulties in, in finding appropriate information. High transaction costs, including brokerage costs, uh, maintenance costs, taxes, uh, risk of neighborhood diversification, possibly political risk because property is always a very political issue. That's an awful lot said about real estate in just a couple of minutes. Obviously this is a specialized area and so a, a, a specialist in real estate would have a much better understanding of all of the fine details and the legal nuances that are part of real estate investment. That's our first class of alternative investments. The second one that we're going to look at, and the major part of today's session, is private equity. One of my favorite topics, and that's because private equity is always a very entrepreneurial type of business. Typically, investments are done by a few executives that are investing millions or sometimes billions of dollars in individual positions. 
private equity firms uh, tend to uh, uh, tend to uh, invest in the most interesting growing businesses and they deal with some of the most difficult valuation problems because we really have no way to value the cash flows of a startup business perhaps private equity as a general class includes things like venture capital leverage buyouts it can, can include things like public investment in sorry private investment in public equities PIPE uh, it can uh, it can involve uh, all kinds of specialized funding, even lending money to banks when they need the money. So it's essentially only distinguished as a class because it's private equity and not public. So anything else that goes into private equity goes. It's a very wide open category. We tend to describe it as the f uh, financing of private businesses, but it can also include um, <clears throat> taking uh, taking private public companies using leverage buyouts. The example of Dell a few years ago where Michael Dell along with a company called Silver Lake bought his company back from the shareholders, took it private, ran it as a private business for a few years, did some acquisitions and is still in the process of taking it back into the in uh, to full public ownership. It can also involve uh, buying uh, uh, distressed debt and distressed equity. And it can involve large-scale financing of big public infrastructure projects and even smaller ones like hospitals or university residences. Typically, private equity is operated through private equity executives that are operating within funds, and fund management companies will run those funds. A good example and a local one that you should have a look at is something called Ventures West. It operates as a company that is essentially run like a partnership of the executives and it's run out of Vancouver and when for example the government of British Columbia wants to channel money to innovative British Columbia businesses they will place a certain amount of money you know perhaps half a billion dollars in a separate fund with Ventures West the province of British Columbia still owns the fund but they're calling on Ventures West to find investments for them and so this fund will be used to fund particularly uh, high potential, high growth, British Columbia based businesses. And so the government is essentially using this particular vehicle to find their investments. And for this, the company will charge a percentage of the total funds under management and a percentage of any capital gain. Now, typically these businesses are run by just a very small number of people they have a few executives, a couple of administrators, they have uh, legal and accounting help, but they become very, very small boutique style investment operations, running funds for, for investors, either one large single investor or a very large number of, uh, of institutional investors and perhaps private investors who want to put their wealth into fast growing businesses. An example of one of those businesses would be one that you might have heard of something called desire to learn we also think of it as d2l and in our case it's been rebranded re as viu learn uh, this young gentleman while he's a student <clears throat> decided that uh, he uh, wanted to to help to develop a virtual learning environment that would be based in canada and uh, so he set up d2l while he was a student marketed it through his own university or to his own university and then carried on with that after he graduated. Uh, having uh, been relatively successful taking this to uh, Southern Ontario universities, he wanted to make the next big step. He needed some money. He wasn't actually having much trouble generating cash flow from the business, but he thought this would be a good time to make a large step. And so he then went to, to uh, uh, a private equity firm who raised, uh, I think, a total of about $160 million dollars in two different rounds of financing. The first round of outside financing was from a venture capitalist. And then they had a, uh, you can hear, see here in, in something called uh, Venture Capital Dispatch in the Wall Street Journal. <clears throat> uh, again, the, uh, the fund has uh, had raised a, a second $85 million. And so as they go through each stage of, the, uh, of their growth, they need a little bit more money, they go back to the market. 
Now, D2L has actually been very successful in creating cash flow from its business activity, so it hasn't had to go back since, I think, 2014 or 2015 for additional funds. When we're talking about uh, <clears throat> venture capital as a business, we can uh, get a good understanding of the business by taking a look at the supply and demand. The, the demand for uh, venture capital uh, is typically going to be organizations like startup businesses or perhaps companies that are in the expansion stage. They need capital to meet, reach the next level to grow uh, or perhaps to acquire another company in their industry perhaps when the, when the industry is going through a consolidation phase. So they need to grow. If you have a fast-growing economy, <clears throat> there's going to be an awful lot more demand for venture capital. If you have a slow-growing economy, you may actually have more money than we have startup businesses, and it becomes a lot more competitive for the venture capitalists. Imagine being a business person and you need $50 million to grow your business, and you have four or five venture capitalists fighting to give you the money. Perhaps in this stage of a business cycle, that's exactly what happens. More cash in the, in the market than we actually have business opportunities. So the supply uh, of venture capital <clears throat> is the other side of the equation. If the, if the entrepreneurial companies provide the demand, then the venture capitalists provide the supply, or they channel the supply. They raise funds from investment banks, from companies, from uh, other public companies that may be in the industry. Some of the biggest providers of venture capital include you know, companies like uh, Amazon, companies like Google, who have, in, in some cases, they actually invest directly through their own venture capital subsidiaries, but they provide venture capital to other companies which will invest. Big pharmaceutical companies also provide venture capital to smaller biotechnology companies. So those are the large companies that, that are part of our supply. We also have um, uh, venture capital providers, <coughs> uh, traditional venture capital investors. We have uh, small individual investors, perhaps people who've made money from investing in their own business, perhaps retired, they have a pool of wealth, they've sold their original business and they want to invest. Now, those can can vary from being the local st shop owner, the local pharmacist who's now retired, to, to Bill Gates and Larry Elson and you know Mark Zuckerberg, people who've made billions of dollars from their own business and they want to invest in startups. And so we often see those named investors when we take a look at venture capital deals. One of the other great things about studying venture capital, and I'll show you exactly how we get that information in a couple of minutes. One of my ex-students who was working for a venture capital firm uh, provided me with this chart <clears throat> as part of his uh, a part of his MBA project. Uh, he actually worked for a company called Granville Baird and was an executive who was working in private equity already when he started his MBA program and essentially said that the ultimate investment, the area that we see over here on the right in the in the green, this uh, this ultimate investment comes from a variety of sources. The original source of the funds might include things like pension funds, banks, governments invest quite a bit in venture capital as part of their uh, initiatives to grow the economy. We also have high net worth individuals, those perhaps those retired uh, retired uh, invest retired business people, and we have corporations. Now they can invest directly in businesses without even going through private equity. In fact, angel investors are well known for approaching businesses and saying, I like your business. If I gave you $10 million, would you be able to find a good use for it? So we could invest directly. In fact, any of these associations or organizations can directly invest in, in uh, the businesses, but they're more likely to go through a private equity firm so that they can spread their investment over several different investments and get a portfolio effect going. Uh, they don't have the control that they would have if they invested directly, but they now have a manager from the private equity firm who's going to ensure that the due diligence is done and that the project continues to be managed. There may be also tax benefits of taking this approach. Of, of course, they're paying for this, and they'll pay about 2% of the total funds under management to the private equity firm 
in order to get them to manage their money, to invest their money and to follow through. And if there's a, a large capital gain, they could the private equity firm could take as much as 20% of the total investment. They call that the carried interest or the carry. And so 2% of the fund size and 20% carried interest, two and 20. It's a standard formula, sometimes as low as one and a half and 15, but essentially that's what the private equity firm gains. Now, also, if you're an investor who's got a lot of money, <clears throat> you might want to spread that among several different private equity firms. And so there's such a thing as a fund of funds. So any of these investors could put their money into a fund of funds who could then place the money with several different private equity firms. And then those private equity firms would, would invest in the businesses. By creating that extra intermediary, we create an extra cost. It's not nearly as high as for the private equity firms. But private equity firms raise a fund. Perhaps they raise a $100 million or a $500 million fund, and they'll operate it for a long period of time, like 10 years in the return of the money. That means that you'd have to wait for a very long time if you put it into one fund. If you go through the fund of funds, they could spread that investment over many different firms and many different funds so that you have a more regular cash flow. It creates a, a bit of liquidity in your investment and more diversification in your portfolio. And that's why the these concierges, as they're sometimes called, where a fund of fund exists to help with the management. We have a number of sources that provide us with information, and one of these is the Canadian Venture Capital Association. You can go directly to their website and get more up-to-date information. You'll see that the sources of funds that are identified in this particular accounting period, in the, uh, uh, in uh, I guess the was this the the, the first f uh, four quarters of 2012, last quarter of 2011, you can see the largest source of fundings were included things like individuals, uh, corporations, corporate venture capital. We have um, funds of funds. We have government funding. We have some pension fund investments, some foreign investments from other international investors. Uh, insurance companies provide some of the funding, and of course some, some others, some non-classified investments. And so you can see the, the flows, well, they, they do tend to be highly periodic depending on the economy and how much demand there is for venture capital. And also a few large deals can really swell especially in a small market like Canada, can smell, can change the, uh, the, the uh, size of the funds that have been invested. Interestingly, we have this category that I mentioned, corporations. And corporations can include you know, big pharmaceutical companies, big technology companies. They all have an interest in investing in growing businesses. Sometimes they'll eventually acquire those companies that they've invested in. Even uh, even universities have been known to create a venture capital fund. For example, here we have the University of Toronto has a, a fund that's called Innovations, and <clears throat> they make investments. Here they've made an investment in something called the, the Biox Corporation, and the CEO is somebody called Dr. David Babcock, well, or Bucock. And, and so the uh, this particular investment is possibly one that's being uh, is developing a, an idea which started at the University of Toronto. They're finding a way to capitalize on their own research and development by channeling money from private investment, not from the university and certainly not from tuition fees, but they're taking money from private investors. They're putting it through their own venture capital firm and using it to develop University of Toronto ideas. And eventually, when this business becomes successful, the profit will flow partly to the, uh, to, to the founders of the company, but also back to the university. In fact, one of the universities that I work with in England, uh, my, guest, my main guest speaker on my venture capital course, eventually set up a venture capital fund. And one of the products of that particular fund was a new element that won a Nobel Prize called graphene. And he became so successful that they stopped making him a guest speaker, and now he teaches my venture capital course. And he was actually the the uh, the chairman of the university's board of governors. He made so much money for the university. <clears throat> there are uh, many stages in the company financing. It varies from uh, early stage financing for the most basic of ideas and the most basic of development. We call seed capital the development of the early stage ideas. Um, 
very small amounts of money usually provided by specialist venture capitalists who work mostly with seed capital and in many cases government agencies are part of that for example in Nanaimo we have Community Futures which is an organization that's set up to help start businesses in Nanaimo they provide small amount of equity and small amounts of loans to start up businesses in order to create uh, a bigger tax base for our community uh, the next stage after startup, after seed rather, is startup, and that's where we have got a product which has been identified. We know what we're going to make. We know how we're going to make it. We have a little bit of an idea who we're going to sell it to. And so that's where we start to bring in a lot of serious money in order to build the factory or to, to create a distribution channel and uh, to, 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 uh, to build up our company. Then we have expansion stages, and the, the next stage is what we'll call first stage. Uh, that's where we start to look for the permanent capital of the company. It's not just a startup anymore. Now it's a real company. And so we're going to need additional funding to have a bigger factory, <clears throat> to expand our market, to create the market share that we're going to need to become self-sustaining. Then we have uh, later stage financing and perhaps that involves a, a later expansion stage, perhaps acquisitions of, uh, of, a, of a competitor or expansion into a new market. And then we also have something called the exit stage. Now, exit is a very important part of private equity because eventually you have to harvest your investments in order to create the capital gains that got those investors interested in the first place. That can involve things like an IPO, which is the ideal of most most uh, managers you know, to get really rich, to float the company, to still own a lot of the company after the IPO, but now you have a market that will value your shares. So if you have a billion dollar company and you created that by selling 100 million of shares in your IPO, you still have 900 million that belongs to the founder shareholders and the venture capitalists who help you to grow. Not many companies do an IPO. A lot more will exit through mergers, acquisitions, uh, buyouts of the managers, perhaps sales to other venture capitalists. So the exit stage is going to be the final stage usually of a, of a company, but we'll come back to that later. It's never quite so simple. Hey, here's an example <clears throat> of a number of investment deals and not all venture capital deals are publicly disclosed we get information from this from sources like Thomson Reuters uh, one source banker database and uh, here's some particular deals that were mentioned by the Canadian Venture Capital Association in this one particular year we had uh, desire to learn an 80 million dollar deal the largest single investor was actually something called Omers and OMERS is the Ontario Municipal Employees Pension Fund. So pension funds may be a major investors. And in this case, it's not a venture capital fund. It's directly done through, the, uh, through this pension fund. And we have something called New Enterprise Associates, which is uh, also a private equity company. Uh, some of these others you might recognize. Uh, Secure Key is actually something, a uh, technology that's used for secure online transactions. And interestingly, the $30 million that was provided included companies like Intel, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, TELUS, Rogers. And these are some of the organizations which could eventually become major customers for this particular technology. Um, you see something called D-Wave Systems, a BC-based company, raised $35 million. Uh, Bezos, isn't that the guy at Amazon? He not only has a company a venture capital company that's part of Amazon called Alexa, believe it or not. But he's got his own venture capital operations that are separate from, from those investments. So, <clears throat> and here we've got something called Engineering Power, and you see several different uh, Canadian government uh, investors that are part of the, the backing for those funds. Uh, this is just a very small picture, a snapshot of one particular period in time. And I'll show you in a couple of minutes where you can get more information, more up-to-date information about venture capital deals. Now, the, the largest funds are quite often the buyout funds. And this is essentially is what happens when a company has been run as a public venture, a public company, publicly traded. Its stocks are available on the stock market. But uh, perhaps it's underperforming. 
and the management thinks the share price should be higher, the company looks like a deal to them, and so they'll approach a venture capitalist and say, let's, let's help, help me to take my company private. Um, this uh, is a, a bigger, seg bigger part of the segment in dollar terms, but not in terms of the number of deals. Essentially, we use very large capitalization funds to take uh, public companies private. Um, <clears throat> it can also be part of uh, a, a, an approach to, uh, to take uh, divisions of pub public companies private to, uh, to buy them out, out from their, their parent organization as an equity carve out. It can uh, be part of a process of adding value because once we take the company private, we don't have to disclose what we're doing and we can make an awful lot of the repairs that we need to make to the organization outside of the public eye. And that would be the easier way to do that. That's what, uh, what Michael Dell's approach was with Dell. He took his company private because the board of directors did not want him to move away from the, the proven platform of selling uh, personal computers and he wanted to get into cloud computing and so he took Dell private turned it into an enterprise uh, uh, solutions company and then be then went back into the process of, uh, of becoming a public company again. Buyout funds can uh, create gains uh, by eventually going back to the market and doing an IPO all over again or they can sell off part of the company uh, and uh, essentially I do this by uh, a, a by uh, a s special dividend. Now, buyout funds are usually highly leveraged. They use a lot more debt in their structure than the private equity firms. Um, the the uh, deals are usually very short lived. In some cases, buyouts have only taken seven or eight months to go from public to private and back to public again, and uh, the returns are going to be. Well, going to have an awful lot more distribu broader distribution because of the error in uh, in measurement of performance. Again, one of my students, uh, Alan, produced this chart that gave you an, a relative idea of deal size versus the size of deal and the investment stage. So some of the biggest deals are IPOs, but in, in this one particular period, the IPOs were the biggest deals, mostly over a hundred million pounds but they weren't the biggest part of the venture capital business. In fact, development capital, which is the mid middle stage investments, and they tended to be between 500,000 and a hundred million dollars in size, but they were the largest proportion of that particular market. Leverage buyouts were bigger than development capital, uh, bigger in terms of size between, uh, well, between five or six million and a hundred million, and there was still a substantial amount of money. But seed and startup, even though numerically they might be the greatest number of deals, they're small amounts of money. And so the, the size of a typical investment might be under $500,000 for uh, seed capital and under $5 million for startup funding, but there are an awful lot more of them. So even, and the total amount of funds invested in them are still relatively small. Now, that's a little bit about the industry. Let's talk a little bit about the way that venture capital works. R remember I said at the beginning, venture capital is provided by executives who manage a fund. There has to be a vehicle or a, a, a legal structure for this. Now, if we've got a little startup company and you think about how much investment they have in the company, say a million dollar investment, and, and they need $5 million to grow, can the venture capitalist do this by creating more common shares? The venture capitalist, if they put up $5 million against, say, half a million dollars that the founders each had, would end up being the majority shareholder. And venture capitalists don't want to be the majority shareholder. So what they do is they create a special type of shares. They keep the common structure essentially the same. Perhaps the venture capitalist will own 30 or 40 percent of the company at the first stage of investment, but they don't want to own more than that because they know there'll be second and third and fourth stages. And if they take half of the common shares at each stage, the owners, the founders of the company will end up owning nothing and have no incentive to continue operating the company. So to get around this, they create something called convertible preference shares. And essentially, these are a special class of, sh class of share that's set up as a preference share that can convert to common equity at a certain point in time and at a certain ratio. Um, they're senior to common shares 
uh, in terms of liquidation. So if something goes wrong, the venture capitalists can get whatever money they can out. Uh, it gives uh, the owners of the company, the founders, an incentive to continue to grow the business to meet the return requirements. And every round of funding, every later round, is going to be senior to the previous round, which is essentially the opposite of what happens with common shares. The founder's shares will always be the, the most important. So the last money in will be the first money out in case of any kind of a problem or an exit if we sell the company. Now, here's an example of how the common shares work. And I got this from a, a textbook uh, by a fellow by the name of uh, Bill Salmon. Uh, essentially, he said <clears throat> that, you know, here we've got a company uh, and the company is founded, you know, let's say in 2007, and they had uh, founder shares. They put up uh, a few hundred thousand dollars in common equity. And then they went to a venture capitalist and they went to their relatives and they raised some money and they used the convertible preference shares. The convertible preference shares were sold at um, 68 cents a share, well, below 60 cents for Series A. Series B, 68 cents. So the second series that they raised was 68 cents a share. And they managed to sell these in two different tranches or two different uh, groups, both at 68 cents a share. And they raised the total uh, of about, uh, about close to $5 million from this this issue that was sold in 2008 to 2010 to a number of different venture capitalists. Now, this meant that the founders still controlled the company because they still had most of the common shares, but now they've got these preferred shares that are out there. They still needed some more money. In 2011, they'd burned through the, uh, the $5 million that they had invested and they needed to raise some more money. So they go back to the venture capitalist the venture capitalists say, yeah, well, we would like to give you some more money, but we've already got a lot in your company. Um, we'll talk to another venture capitalist and perhaps we'll get them involved. So maybe half of the shares will be provided by the new venture capitalist and half by the existing ones that are we're into the Series B. And they'll, they'll raise, uh, they'll sell another 444,000 shares and raise another million dollars. Now, the Series C shareholders the later series are the ones that are going to be the senior shareholders now. It'll include 50% of the original guys and 50% of the new guys. But in order to get the new people to put their money up, you have to give them the superior rights. And also because the company has done a lot to increase its value, these, these shares are now selling at $2.25 a share. So the number of shares that the new shareholders get will be significantly reduced. So they'll only have 444,000 versus about one and a half million shares that have already been issued. Uh, they need more money after another year, so they repeat this all over again. Now the shares are selling at $4.50, and so the, the value of the company increases with each round of the funding. In fact, the total funds invested in this business, by the time we get to 2014 in this case, are about $46 million in total funding that's divided by all of the shares that have been issued in all of the previous rounds. So we have a, a company that is now ready to perhaps move on to the next stage. So this is the, the stages of investment. Here's a live company. Uh, well, actually, they're not really alive. They've gone quite, kind of quiet recently. Uh, I first noticed them when I was uh, in China. And every time you get into an elevator, there's a television providing advertising and maybe a little bit of news. And so on the, the trip between floors, everybody's watching TV. Uh, the TVs are provided by Focus Media. They also do a certain amount of online advertising. Uh, based in Shanghai, <clears throat> and I think founded by Jason Zhang, uh, this particular company got its, uh, its first rounds of financing from something called SoftBank and United Capital. They got about $40 million in 2003. Then they sold Series B uh, to... Uh, uh, a whole bunch of different companies, both international venture capital and Chinese venture capital through a Series B convertible. Uh, and then the, the same issue, they also included a, a, one of the world's biggest venture capital companies, perhaps the biggest a company called Carlyle. They sold them 35 million. Uh, then they had a, the next series was uh, sold through uh, uh, 3i Group, one of the biggest br uh, British venture capital firms, Goldman Sachs, and a couple of the ones who'd been involved earlier. 
uh, United Capital from the very beginning and KTV Ventures. They sold them the C-Series. By this point, the company had grown. It had screens all over China uh, and uh, it was ready to do a, a, an IPO. They, they floated on NASDAQ and uh, did an IPO that raised 557 million. Actually, it raised about 170 million dollars uh, of new money and that gave the company a value of 557. So the value of all of the previous shares that were converted to common equity plus the new money gave it a total market value of 557. The total new cash raised was only 171 million dollars for about 3 million new shares that were issued. That would have been the end of a lot of stories, but here we had uh, a company that uh, had now gone to market and the growth was not meeting expectations. The share price fell rather than went up. And so in order to rescue the share price, a number of those venture capital investments, including some of the original investors and a number of major Chinese investors, and even the founder of the company, they took the company private through a leveraged buyout and they bought the company back from the market for a total price of $3.6 billion. Um, again, you'd say that's the end of the story. Well, uh, the story is, is not yet finished. Uh, in 2018, Alibaba bought into the business for a total investment of $2.2 .2 billion for an undisclosed number of shares and undisclosed structure. So funding isn't just something that happens once. It's something that is an ongoing process, especially if the company has got a very dynamic pattern of growth. If I want information about companies like this, quite often I go to a source like Crunchbase. And if I'm using my subscription service, I'll use the Thomson, uh, Thomson uh, One Banker database. And that will give me a, 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 a summary of all of the venture capital deals. But that's an expensive product and not everybody has access to it. A lot of the data, though, does end up being also reported through sources like Crunchbase. And so here you can see if you're interested in D2L. You can get information on the company, on each round of financing, who all of the parties that were involved were, and you know, all of the most recent news that has been reported. So basically it's a news reporting website. Take a look at it. You can take a look at companies that are public now, as well as companies that are private who may aspire to be public in the future. It's the best source of, of information on private companies, or the best free source. Uh, private equity firms, or funds rather, <coughs> are set up, uh, uh, funds are set up within firms. So if I set up a private equity firm, I own the company, I will set up the private equity fund as a limited liability corporation or limited partnership. The people who run the fund are called the general partners, and they're going to find the investors who become the limited partners. Limited partners have low, no liability beyond the, the loss of their investment. The general partners make the decisions and charge the fees. Typically a fund runs for a fixed amount of time, perhaps seven to ten years. They raise funds, they invest the funds, they sell the investments, and then they close the fund. The objective uh, is to get the full value out of all of the investments in the business before the fund is liquidated and all of the money is returned back to the original investors. Um, the uh, li limited uh, partnership is taxable at the shareholder level, so the, the fund itself doesn't have to pay taxes. In fact, if you're one of those general partners who's running the fund, you're going to earn um, the carried interest which means that you pay the capital gains rate, which is something that bothers a lot of people that venture capitalists essentially pay half of the tax rate of everybody else. This is something that came up when Mitt Romney was running to be president a few years ago. People noted that as a venture capitalist, as a private equity fund manager, he earned the carried interest, which was a capital gain, which was taxed at half the rate. And so he wasn't paying as much tax as normal Americans. Anyway, the uh, back on to our, with our story, <clears throat> um, there's no liability for the limited partners beyond the initial investment. Uh, they try not to uh, maintain too much uninvested capital. Now, the other word we use for uninvested capital is dry powder. So if the fund is sitting on a lot of dry powder, it means that 
they haven't managed to put that money into investments. When they approach the companies, they say, hi there, would you like to put $10 million into my fund? And the fund manager says, yes, I'll make a commitment for $10 million. The money's drawn down as the investments are made. And so they might not actually make a call for the cash for six months or a year after the commitment is made. And then once they've got it, they will invest it into a company. The uh, uh, manager, <clears throat> the general partner, receives a fee of about 2% per annum. And uh, then they have the, the carry. And the carried interest is essentially the capital gain, a percentage of the capital gain. It's usually 15 to 20%. So when somebody says 2 and 20, that means 2% of the funds under management and 20% carried interest. That's the return. Uh, they may also have limits that say that unless we make this much of a rate of return on the fund, they, uh, they, they won't get that carried interest. And if the investments do, do badly later, the, there may be a provision to, to pay back some of the carried interest. Now, how well did you do? We always try to have benchmarks, but for private equity, this is especially difficult. Um, we seldom have data provided, and we get data when we when we raise funds, when we sell companies, or do an IPO, or when the businesses fail, when our investments fail. Then we have hard and fast uh, data points, but otherwise, the it all comes down to subjective valuation. Some data sources. Thomson Venture, uh, Thomson One, and uh, Cambridge Associates will provide uh, information on existing funds. They get that information from organizations like the Canadian Venture Capital Association, the British Venture Capital Association, and so on. Uh, they calculate the internal rate of return for funds. They provide appraisals that are based on the self-reported information by the funds. And quite often that information is old information, a year, year old information. Uh, and then they will f they'll compare the funds by the year in which the fund was started, or the vintage year. We have indexes that are provided based on that. They're quite rare, uh, but these indexes are, 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 are typically based solely on information about publicly traded ones who report. That includes uh, companies like uh, Apollo Asset Management, Blackstone, Kohlberg Kravis Roberts, or KKR, Carlyle, uh, Oak Tree. So some of the big, biggest venture capital companies are also publicly traded, and so they report. And so from that information, we can have things like uh, the Standard & Poor's Private Equity Index. And this can also be used to create exchange-traded funds, which we can then use uh, to uh, invest small amounts of money directly through stock markets. Private equity uh, is a good thing to have in every portfolio because it has a low correlation with other investments like stocks and bonds, although that may be partly due to the stale date on the reported information. Um, <clears throat> it can help to bring the, uh, 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 if, if we, rather if we did use uh, 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 the better quality information, uh, it would give us higher correlation and uh, risk reduction may be uh, modest if we're using this kind of an approach. Uh, we, we have heard about uh, private equity returns or about measuring returns using the annualized holding period yield approach. Quite often the promise of venture capitalist is it will provide you with a, a certain type of return. We'll give you triple your money in three years or three times your money in five years or five times your money in five years. And that translates into a, an annualized holding period yield of 59 or 32 or 43 percent. So the calculation, as you recall from our earlier discussions, if we say we're going to give you five times your money in five years, that the calculation would be a return of five plus one to the fifth root. And that would give us a value of 1.43. Turn it from a quotient into a percent, we subtract the one, that means our annualized holding period yield is 43%. That's the rate it'll take to give you five times your money in five years. Of course, that promise is seldom exactly realized. We may see that in aver on average across all venture capital firms, the long-term rate of return is just slightly greater than the return on public equity. The diversification provides an awful lot of the incentive to invest in private equity. Uh, some of the characteristics 
important characteristics of private equity. It's illiquid because there's it's difficult to sell private equity investments. There is actually a, something called secondary purchase, but it is not a formalized market. There's no way to sell your sell your investments in a venture capital investment on a day-to-day -day basis or to trade them. Requires a long-term capital investment, perhaps five, seven, or ten years. Uh, we have a higher risk than public equity. We expect a higher rate of return. If we're looking at, uh, at, at receiving three times your money in five years, it's well above 30% target rate. We have um, uh, poor quality information, especially if we're looking at investments in startup businesses and seed capital. Uh, some of the things that we have to think about when we're doing private equity, um, it's very difficult to achieve diversification if you're a small investor. The buy-in for a single fund might be 10 or 15 or 20 million dollars. And so if you've only got 30 or 40 million, only 30 or 40 to invest, in, it definitely it's going to be hard to find a single private equity investment, at least investing directly. Um, funds tied up for a long period of time. Um, once you make a promise to provide the funds, you have to deliver the funds or else there's a penalty. This was interesting during the financial crisis in 2009. Banks had made commitments to invest in venture capital funds, found they were short of cash, went to the venture capital funds and said, sorry, you know, we can't provide our money. The venture capitalist said, well, sorry, you, you promised you pay up or we'll, uh, we'll sue you. And so the banks would provide the money to the venture capital funds who would then use it to invest in the banks. So they actually actually had the, the banks investing in themselves and charged them 2% for the privilege of doing it. Um, it's uh, <clears throat> uh, also difficult to be find a, an appropriate diversification strategy, a, a mix of investments by sectors and by, by geography, for example, or stage of investment. A, a lot of material in the last hour or so, but that's only part of alternative investments. In our next session, we'll take a look at well, a, a shorter video, I hope, where we'll look at things like commodities, uh, hedge funds, and distressed funds. So that will be the next part of, of this course. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It's just an introduction. If you are interested in this topic, I'd encourage you to, to, to read more. And of course, see me with any questions. Thanks for listening.